And last week's number one, down to number two, Underworld from Ultimate. Britain's number one. This Christmas, we'll spend over 30 million pounds on home computer games. This highly competitive business is flooded with thousands of software fantasies. This is the story of two companies, both searching for the magic ingredient which will make their game a Christmas hit. Imagine Software only started making computer games two years ago, but by early 1984, their turnover is already millions of pounds a year. Games like Arcadia have brought their founders instant success and rich rewards. Mark Butler is just 23. But fast cars are the style for everyone at Imagine, and fantastic salaries for the star programmers. Publicity and image have become as important a part of the business as the games. With money to spend, they can indulge in the kind of pleasures which are beyond the dreams of most their age, TT bike teams and big houses. As sales race ahead, so this new industry honor Imagine with its own version of the Hollywood Oscars, the Golden Joystick. By May 1984, the company has grown so rapidly that it employs over 70 people producing computer games. Now established with expensive offices in the centre of Liverpool, Imagine's plan for a Christmas winner is based on a radically different product, the Mega Game. Do you know where Bill is? David Ward started Ocean Software a year ago in Manchester. He acts as a software publisher, attracting games from programmers across the country. We load them up. And he's also sent his new game as well to have a look at, which is called Castle Capers. What do you think of this, guys? He employs a handful of his own programmers to write games in-house and to help judge the freelance ideas. I mean, I think maybe not the graphics, the animation isn't, isn't Commodore standard anymore is it it's not state of the art well the order didn't go out till tuesday so you should be receiving it any time at the moment david ward has high standards he rejects 99 percent of what arrives at ocean every month <coughs> 16 year old jonathan smith has just walked in with pud pud a game that he wrote at home the weird world, the weird world. What's, what's the object of the game, Jonathan? What's the thing Sales director Paul Finnegan helps to assess the merits of Pud Pud and of its young author. It's bad. It's life, you have to collect ten puddings. How long have you taken to write this? From the, from about seven weeks. Seven weeks? And how long have you been programming? Uh, about a year. About a year. Ward likes Pud Pud so much that he pays Jonathan a thousand pounds for it and gives him a job at Ocean. But he knows that it's not the Christmas hit that he's searching for. And what we're coming up to is the most important selling period for us. Um, as the software industry has become more seasonal in line with an entertainment industry, um, we're looking at the period between the beginning of September and the end of January as being maybe 70% of the, of the year's sales. At Imagine, everybody's in early as the plans for the new mega game take shape. With so much competition, they recognise the need this year to create something completely different. Well, if you look at a normal cassette game uh, at the moment or as it was, we've come to the limits of the machine. Whatever machine it's for, you cannot go any further. So you've got 480 software houses in Britain 
producing the same version of the same game, although it looks slightly different, they call it another name, it's still all the same. Um, we wanted to do, as we said two years ago, something different. And this is it, Bandersnatch, the ultimate adventure game, which, when it's finished, Imagine claim will take you into a fantasy world. The secret of Bandersnatch's power is a special piece of electronics, a hardware add-on to the home computer, which eventually will be reduced to a small cartridge and sold with the game. As the only programmer on the team over 30, John Gibson is known as Grandad, and for the moment he's struggling with an animation problem. OK, well, it's, it's functioning all right now. He's going at a proper speed, and that's the policeman. He's going at a proper speed as well. Now, what I was trying to do was to compensate for the fact that uh, the speed change when he moved into a new scene, and the code's not working properly, so when he goes into the new scene, everything's suddenly going at terrific speed. So, that is a bug. Damn it. We've done things like, uh, we've got cartoon animation in the game, which you couldn't get in a, a, an ordinary computer. We've got real sound in the game, and we've got real control of a, a full life of animated figure, which you can do literally anything you want with. Artists and programmers are rushing to get the story and the characters finished. First drawn on paper, the full-size figures are then put into the computer. Using this cast, the teams can then devise the mythical world that the characters will inhabit. An elaborate maze of tunnels, landscapes and hazards, which will become the scenes of the adventure. Leave a bomb or something. Told us got to do bomb. Get out quick. <laughs> Where's that one go? It's good, that one. Yeah. Sure. Why is it going to get a D in? Why can't it come back up again? If you can come up to it, but you can't go up any further because that's it. It's only got one. But left. Bandersnatch is beginning to drain Imagine's ample resources. Programmers have been pulled off other games, and the company must gamble a huge sum on producing the hardware add on. The investment we have to make is. Um, approximately two million pound to find that money which is more than twice last year's profits the directors have been working all night on a company plan inevitably they're using computers to help them to produce a funding proposal which they hope will attract the investment they need but this is a young industry with new companies forming every month and traditional investors are suspicious of its bizarre nature so that's the only snag. If you want to come to the show with me, you have to wear that. At outfit. Ocean, David <laughs> Ward is still looking for his Christmas hit. Front runners are sequels to last year's successful games, Kong the, the, and the Hunchback. Eighteen-year-old Tony Pomfrey is one of the eight resident programmers at Ocean. He's busy keying in the instructions, which will set new hazards for the Hunchback Quasimodo to overcome. Well, the objective is, um, yet again, you're Quasimodo, and you have to manage to rescue Esmeralda, which is stranded in the Belfry. Um, there's a lot of obstacles facing you, such as uh, bats that fly around and knock you off ropes and things. Uh, spiders, which can bite you and kill you as well. This blob is supposed to be a hunchback, although it's not been, he hasn't actually been drawn yet. The idea is you have to try and walk over the top of these, these bells, and you can see them. It's taken about a week to manage to get the basic idea together and to put the to actually get the rope swinging and the guy jumping. It's taken about three days. It will be going up and down. With oh yeah, he's got to be able to shin up the rope, even though the rope no, itself. The rope will be moving up and down. Will right. he move up and down with it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. A few days later, the team meets under David Ward's watchful eye to work out how Hunchback Two can improve on Hunchback One. Different ways of, of, of achieving a good result yeah. needs to be progressively more difficult, even and also, if you've played it once before. And also, by trying to attain points that way, it would make it more difficult to complete the screen. Yeah. While the storyboard is finished, there are still some intriguing items for the youthful design team to wrestle with. A real-time game. Yeah. What about the other characters that, we, that we're involving here, the other elements of the game? Um, the spiders, well, this, the well, bats. The yeah. We've got a caterpillar here. What can a caterpillar? this thing we here? We've kicked them down, not a caterpillar. caterpillar. I don't like the idea of a no. caterpillar. No, no, it's, Besides, it's... Um, it doesn't fit in with the... What's it doing up a belfry? Yeah, what's yeah. it doing <laughs> in a belfry? Yeah, we've got spiders and we've got rats. 
dreaming up computer fantasies is nothing if not a serious occupation. Could have parts in the screen as well. But selling computer games is a seasonal business, and this summer is particularly difficult for Imagine sales manager Sylvia Jones. It's never been as slow as it is now. Never. It wasn't like this this time last year. It slowed down dramatically in the last three months. Not just for Imagine, for everybody. Probably because there are a lot more software houses now producing goods than there were this time last year. Sylvia has come to see Imagine's Birmingham distributor. He wants to discuss the slow-selling old games, but Sylvia would rather interest him in the Bandersnatch mega game. Good morning, Sylvia. Good morning. Good to see you again. But she has a problem in introducing the idea to managing director Chris Hedges. He's looking at new games every week, but since the mega game isn't finished, she has nothing to show him, and she hasn't even seen it herself. When are we going to see it, uh, Sylvia Bandersnatcher? Probably about four weeks. And how are we seeing it? You're going to send us samples? We're going to give you a preview. And we probably will send you a sample as well. But we'll mm -hmm. give you a preview. It's yet to be decided. So it's four weeks away, preview. A preview. When's yes. launch? Yes. Well, I'd say the end of July. Really? Yes. If we can do it sooner, we will do. So you're looking at six weeks to launch? Yeah. Yeah? Have you got any details of the uh, well, A, the product, and B, the launch programme? Uh, no, nobody says the launch programme. They will follow, though. They're not decided yet. I can tell you that there's 25, possibly 30 items in the box. That now, sounds complicated. It isn't really. No? It's going on 48K, but there will be a piece of hardware to come with it, which ah. increases the power of the computer. But Hedges is becoming increasingly concerned that all these extra features will push the cost way beyond the average game price of six pounds. Uh, I can see what you're doing. I mean, I, I, have you got any price uh, points for it yet? Approximately. Going to retail at about forty pounds, thirty-nine ninety-five. It's every time I speak to you, it goes, it goes up. up. Yes, I know. You get used to it. Uh, forty pounds. But that's got to be something extraordinary, Sylvia. So oh, it's certainly to sell at that, it is. At that price. It is totally different from anything you've ever seen before. I mean, it really isn't just software, it's, no. it's software stroke hardware. There's also music tape which goes with the game, and we're thinking now of having an LP made of the music. That's a separate idea altogether, to go out after the game. We're going to have a voiceover, probably a famous name voiceover, on mm -hmm. the music for the tape, the computer game itself. Well, I mean, obviously we've just got to wait and see, haven't we? It's, yeah. it's, it's now, you've now taken the the product, in my mind, beyond sort of uh, understanding, but I've seen it. Back in Liverpool, the Imagine directors have a problem. The release of the game has been delayed, so instead they must produce new press handouts with more hard information. I've been speaking to the media, and we've hyped them up so much that unless we actually deliver some goods to them soon, it's going to come off the boil. Yeah. And this is a way of delivering some meat to them. What we want in our time so we keep them on the boil until the release. Because otherwise, they're just going to forget about us soon because they're just going to get fed up. Because they've had enough hype with our substance, now they've got to have some substance. What's more, financial director Ian Hetherington has not raised his two million pounds, and sales are so bad that the company is having difficulty paying its suppliers. Their cassette duplicator is waiting for 50,000 pounds that Imagine owes him. We get it back in the printer Monday, and the release goes out to the press a week Tuesday. Okay, so that's the current timing. In fact, I don't know why I've gone to so many uh, visuals, because there's so little you can actually do with this. <laughs> well, because I've been waiting for this meeting for so long, I've had to get the studio going on some things. You've got your things, uh, artwork. They need money urgently. Even the Bandersnatch box will require expensive colour printing. To lose these, or, um, if it's printed on the inside, you know, it's not going to get lost. It's not the call he's been waiting for, and the financial crisis is worsening by the hour. I'll take them, Mike. Okay. Right, so I'll start on them. No, just make a point. We don't do anything, right? I mean, we don't.
place any orders without my say so. Oh, no, that's dead easy. Anywhere. I can't stress this too greatly. We must not commit to any expense at all, okay? But the problem of money that the company has already spent remains, as does this anxious supplier. But what has led to this crisis in their fortunes? Everyone in the industry claims that a substantial loss of income is caused by the selling of pirate cassettes. But how large a threat is professional counterfeiting or even schoolboy copying? And how do you recognize the genuine from the fake or know when it's being sold? Street markets are thought to be a good place to look. We took David Ward of Ocean to a market outside Manchester. The industry believes that stalls like this are a common source of pirate tapes. And indeed, we did find illegal music cassettes being sold for two pounds each, like this copy of Frankie Goes to Hollywood's latest release, with its crude black and white photocopy of the label. But from the evidence of a police raid earlier in the year, David Ward is convinced that there is also much more professional counterfeiting of computer games, something which may cost Ocean £100,000 in sales over the year. We have here a couple of tapes. This is one of our top-selling games of last year, Punchback. And we can see here that we've got... This is a, a commercially pirated copy as opposed to something that somebody's made at home. These people have gone to the, 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 the business of, of reprinting coloured inlay cards, which is quite expensive to set up. So they would obviously have had to have done several thousand to make it worth their while. The difference, I suppose, to the, to the average chap in the street wouldn't, wouldn't be that obvious. On the left here is the real thing, and on the right is a, a very professional piece of computer piracy. Now, with this kind of situation, we obviously suffer a commercial loss because the total number of programs sold are dramatically affected by the fact that we are not making all the programs that are sold. That isn't quite the same situation as what's called home copying, where a chap borrows his neighbor's cassette and reproduces it for himself. I think our real problem in the industry is people making copies for gain on a large scale rather than the, the odd schoolboy at home copying. Although I don't condone that, I don't think it's as big or as significant. And I think in a way it's an endemic part of computer hacking that kids will try and get into a tape. And it, it's part of the, the whole industry of, of, of computing and, 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 and that sort of thing. But it's doubtful whether Imagine's problems are anything to do with piracy, schoolboy or professional, and the outlook now looks bleak. The only director left on the premises for the past week seems resigned to a gloomy future. As you can see, it's fairly empty. I think uh, a lot of people are going to the pub quite early these days. But um, they've had the video cassette recorder playing this morning. They've all been watching an American werewolf in, in London. And uh, you see they've been making flags and decorating the place generally instead of doing work. Because why bother? They all know that, you know, there's no point. No one will supply us with anything. So we've got no cassettes to sell. So the company's come to a full stop. The, this company cannot continue trading for another week unless there's a cash injection of, I would say, it needs next week about half a million pounds. But events take place faster than Everest predicts. Within hours, he's resigned. And when some of the staff come back from lunch, there's an unexpected welcome. Can you tell me you all get off that, please, okay, Michael? Yeah. You will not. You will let go, please, Michael. Can you tell us what's happening? You will get your foot off the door, please. Thank you. Agents of the bailiff have moved in, and no one seems to know who's running the company. Why can't we come in? Come in. Why not? You can't get in. Why not? Because they're not allowing you. Who is it? They're not. Ready me? 
I've got an alternative, I've got an alternative jacket. Look, can't you read it says no entry, please? Did you get my bag now? Oh my god, it's all going to be repossessed, you know. Meanwhile, the show goes on. The giant personal computer world exhibition has arrived at Olympia. The event is frantic with activity. Every hardware and software manufacturer is anxious to be seen and to sell. biggest of the computer shows and this is the last chance for the industry to exhibit ideas before Christmas. David Ward is busy with some foreign buyers. And the new Hunchback is here too. In two months time it'll be launched onto its discerning young clients. And enough of the game has now been written for a sneak preview at Ocean's Stand. We're really showing it to show what's wrong with it. One of the advantages of coming to a show is you can get opinions from people who are actually going to be the buyers. I think sometimes in this industry we forget about the fact that we're making all this, this product, these programs, to entertain and stimulate and, 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 and hopefully please people who are actually computer users who are going to buy them. So from this we can see the reaction. The first reaction is that the characters are not good. The, the figure of Hunchback himself has not been well received. Possibly because <laughs> he looks as though he's a kind of, uh, I don't know, a pterodactyl with a, with, with a green blob on his back. But he will be improved that. And in fact, the graphics can be put in at the last minute because essentially you work out the algorithms of the game, the game show, and then the graphics can be put in later. Showing individual customers their new idea is one thing, but the big distributors need convincing of the game's value. Webster's warehouse near Guildford is one of the biggest. It ships over 100,000 cassettes every week to 1,400 major high street stores around the country. What Webster's choose to stock is critical. Every month, they accept 100 new games, but they reject 500. It's the 1st of November. There are only weeks before the Christmas selling season begins. Ocean sales director Paul Finnegan has come to Webster's to demonstrate to their buyer an almost finished version of the game. Basically this is where left off from the original Hunchback, the final screen which we never used. So we decided to, to start the, the game off with this one. How many screens actually would you show us? Well we have, we have there's, there's five screens. Just to give you an idea of the, the right. graphics and the player right. base here. Yeah. Okay. So when uh, you think you will be able to launch the Spectrum version? Well, the, the release date is November the 15th. Right. Um, but this year, the game itself isn't enough. Webster's also want to know what kind of advertising and marketing plans Ocean have for the launch of Hunchback 2. What's an advertising schedule? What's the release schedule? That's an idea of the... Right. Of the leaflets that we're about to launch. Again, we can supply these to you in any sort of quantity. Right. That's the hunchback. Do you have any other uh, point of sale material, for example, badges? Um... Um, we don't. No, we don't have any badges or, or hats or anything Hat, at the moment. No. no. This looks... that's, that's a poster with the both games on. Yeah, that's if he's convinced, the buyer will place an order a week before the launch. The same evening, at a school near Manchester, one class has stayed behind to give Hunchback his sternest test yet. Jump off the edge. God, jump off the edge. 
No badge. Tony Pomfrey has brought the almost finished version for the computer club to cast a critical eye over. Their verdict may still bring last minute changes to the design. I think it's very good. It's pretty good graphics. Uh, I like the way he rolls up and down on the, on the screw. Yeah. It was a good idea, though. That's quite nice as well. The way it's planned out is very structured, and I like the the graphics. I think it's a good game altogether. I like the idea where um, the man goes up and down there. It's so sort of bells and there's this little monster. We have to go a little fast. Quite good. Looks a bit funny. I like the hunchback. And I like the bats. I find it quite difficult to um, get over the bat on the first one. Uh, well, it's challenging. Uh, that's the kind of thing sort of I look in a game. Uh, a challenge not too hard and not too easy. And I think this would sort of fit the bill. So the experts seem happy with the design. But will they buy it? If I had the money. Mm -hmm. A week later, the distributor decides to invest in Hunchback 2, with an initial order for 2,700 copies. But it takes Ocean another 10 days to prepare for mastering the magnetic tape. On November the 23rd, the duplication process begins. In just a few hours, the first 5,000 copies are made. At a wholesale price of £2.50, these finished cassettes at 50 pence each are the dearest part. About 40 pence pays for programming, which leaves about £1.50 for marketing, distribution and a healthy profit. We will ship the first week probably 20,000 units. We will hope to get at least one major repeat before Christmas and one major repeat just afterwards, in that period when people who got a computer for Christmas are looking for software to to play on it. Yep, this week's software games top ten as compiled. As the shopping bonanza gets underway for Christmas in the first week of December, Hunchback has only just reached the high street. From US Gold at nine, up from twelve, Danger Mouse from Creative Sparks, and at eight, up from eleven, Beachhead from US Gold. And there are two hundred other new games released this Christmas, fighting for attention. If Hunchback is to make it to number one, the shops will have to sell 60,000 by January. Although it's not had time to get into the charts yet, so far 30,000 copies have gone out to the wholesalers and it's selling well. But in a business that's seen spectacular growth and failure, David Ward has realised what the key to success is. This industry has grown from being a cottage industry to being a major supplier in the high street, and it requires all the skills of, of, of business. That being a supplier to high street stores requires, whether you're supplying them with radios or toothpaste or cornflakes or whatever. This industry makes money out of, out of top ten hits, just like the pop single record industry. And imagine... They had the image of the pop record industry, but not the business skills to survive. But the name will. David Ward bought it from the liquidator, and he now employs Grandad and others from the team writing games for Ocean. <laughs> 